Well, it's great to see you, and uh, as you're turning to Luke chapter 7, I uh, want to remind you that uh, this is in your bulletin, the second Sunday, one minute. Uh, it's good to be reminded, and there's a bunch of bullets on there about biblical giving, and today I want to highlight it's to be sacrificial. I picked up the uh, update, and I don't know just when it came out because I'm usually behind, but I read it this week, and, and I was thrilled to hear one more time from John Corey in that interview. If you haven't read it, I commend it to you. But his passion, even now that he's with the Lord, you know, but I mean, I was still hearing his voice as he was saying, uh, give, give. He said, some of us, Many of us could give $10,000 and not even adjust our lifestyle, still drive the same car, have the same house, and it just sounded like John, and I love his passion. And it thrilled me because as I read it, I realized, I don't know when it came out, but maybe that was used, maybe even him speaking on the paper because we'd received a $10,000 gift kind of out of left field, so to speak, from one of you for the RP. And I think, you know, what a thrill it is to give uh, sacrificially. John said you could do, many of us could give $10,000 and not even adjust our lifestyle. But uh, I exhort you this week to pray about giving. I know the gals had a great time at the retreat and they gave to a project at the hospital there in, in uh, Niger with Kendrick and Alicia. And uh, give in such a way that you have to adjust your lifestyle. Stop, you know, decide, instead of doing this, I'll give it to the Lord. It's an exciting way to give. Uh, David said, I don't want to give something that won't cost me anything. Uh, Jesus commended the widow who gave everything. And, of course, the Philippian church in 2 Corinthians 8, they gave according to their ability... And then Paul said, and beyond their ability. They gave out of deep poverty. So uh, stick that in your Bible. Think about it. It's good to regularly think about giving. Luke chapter 7. The seventh chapter of Luke. And uh, I was thrilling as we were singing those great worship songs and uh, thinking about Christ, the cornerstone. And Jesus' words to us last week as he uh, exhorted us, uh, by extension, he was talking to them when he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? And then he gave that moving analogy of us building our lives either on sand or on the firm foundation, hearing God's word and acting on it. Father, even as we come to your word now, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Speak to us by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When he had departed all his discourse, I'm picking it up right there at chapter 7, right after those words of Jesus. When he completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a certain centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. And when he'd heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. And when they'd come to Jesus, they earnestly entreated him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not fit for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For indeed, I am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, 
And to my slave, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the multitude that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Now, immediately, just reading it, I am struck with our Lord's high commendation of this centurion's faith. (laughs) I mean, he turned to the multitude and said, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Not just such faith, such great faith. (laughs) This is the same term he used when he said, have I been so long with you, Philip, and you haven't come to know me? We've got so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Hebrews 11 starts out. This is the language he used of this man's faith. Great faith. Such faith. I haven't found this kind of faith. He said, even in Israel. And remember who it is who's making this commendation. It's our Lord Jesus Christ. He is not given to exaggeration, or hyperbole, or idle words, or just saying what people want to hear, you know, like you and I are so prone to. He marveled at the great faith, and he commended it publicly. He wasn't like, you know, some teenagers saying, awesome, you know, we have our words, don't we? I mean, it takes one to know one. I get stuck on words, you know, but we, we love to call things great, stupendous, fabulous. We, you know, we, for a while, I, I used to keep up with it. I, I don't anymore because there's just Chris and I at the table. I used to have a round table of kids, you know, and you'd hear the words, you know, that come along. I remember one time, years ago, you'd never figure out who this is because you wouldn't know him anyway. Kid came over, and he had dinner with us, and man, he said, this is a sick meal. And, and they'd been a sick concert he'd been to, and it was a sick time over at the mall when they all gathered. It was sick time, and it was sick, 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 sick. And when he left, he had to leave early. I think he didn't like my glare. I don't know. No, I don't glare at kids of my own. But, but anyway, he, he left early. We were still sitting around the table, and I remember saying to honey, to my wife, I said, honey, this is a sick meal, man. <laughs> and uh, that guy's a sick guy, and this was a sick evening, and my daughter said, okay, dad, I get the point. And I said, no, I'm, I'm serious. This was sick, man. <laughs> and somehow that word never caught on in our house. But anyway, Jesus didn't talk that way. And he doesn't talk like I do either, you know, overusing words. No, he marveled at such great faith. This is the Lord speaking. I want to hear. And notice, look at verse 9. He didn't just commend, really. He didn't just say, now that is great faith. He marveled at him. Now, this is a term he wondered. He was amazed. That gets my attention. Because we rightfully marvel at the Lord. I I mean, we surely should. And we use songs, you know, our songs have words of marvel, wonder, Amazement. I was hearing all those words in these songs, and you hear them every Sunday because that's only proper when you start thinking about God, that we would speak in terms of marveling and amazement and wonder. Luke used it four times in the first two chapters about the miraculous birth. The people marveled that Zacharias didn't come out when he went in. And they marveled nine months later 
when he took a tablet and said, his name is John, they marveled. There's nobody in his family named John. And then his tongue was loose to praise God, you remember? And they marveled, they wondered at all the things the shepherds were saying in chapter 2. And later, Joseph and Mary, when Simeon started talking about this baby, they marveled at the things being said about him. By the way, if you haven't, I hope you will. And I hope that the things we say about Jesus, if you've just come in here and you're kind of looking Christianity over, welcome. We marvel at him. We marvel at the things said about him. We marvel at the things said by him. And Luke uses this term fairly regularly. It was common in the first century, and it's still a common phenomena. Uh, we marvel today. We marvel at ninth inning rallies. <laughs> this time of year, I do. Could you believe it? This is unbelievable, the commentator said last night when the Yankees, you know, you didn't watch. <laughs> okay, we marvel at two-minute drives in the fourth quarter. In Oregon's case, one-minute drives. It's 30-second drives, you know. We marvel at money made quickly. We marvel at political promises. Politicians making promises. We say, oh, yeah, great. That's awesome. That's wonderful. We marvel at slogans. In other words, we marvel at the trivial. <laughs> really. You think about what causes you and I to marvel. Sadly, tragically, man marvels at the wrong thing so, quite often. <clears throat> and history is going to close. I trace this through. And uh, men are very susceptible. When you're marveling at the wrong things, you become gullible. And you'll marvel at just about anything. And then there'll be things that will really make you marvel. And I read in Revelation 13 that the whole world marveled at the beast, the Antichrist, because he'd pulled off some sort of false resurrection. His head wound was healed. No, marveling is uh, something that we tend to do at the wrong things. But in the Bible, marveling, I mean, in Luke, they marveled at Jesus' birth. They marveled at John's birth, rightfully so. They marveled in chapter 4 at his gracious words. They marveled when he got up and said, hush, be still. And they said, who is this? Chapter 8, verse 25, 26. That even the wind and the seas obey him. And they marveled. They were amazed. They were amazed, and you'll read it. And if you're reading Luke, you remember these. Chapter 9, when he rebuked demons, and they just did what he said. Chapter 11, this man who can't talk, he's deaf and dumb. All of a sudden, his tongue is loosed. He can hear, and he can speak perfectly. They marveled as well they might. But there's more. The Pharisees marveled, chapter 11, that he didn't wash his hands ceremonially before meal, didn't go through their rituals. They marveled when they tried to trick him regarding taxes. <laughs> what about taxes? What do you think? And he said, you render to Caesar what is Caesar, you render to God what is God. And they marveled at his answers. The disciples marveled, John 4, that he talked with a woman, and not just a woman, a Samaritan woman. Now, Jesus, everything he said, everything he did, properly evokes marveling. And I read twice in Luke 24 that they were amazed. They marveled at the empty tomb. <laughs> Peter marveled when he got there. And later, when they thought they were seeing a ghost, he said, do you have anything here to eat? And they marveled, and they couldn't believe it for joy. And by the way, before I leave that thought, in John 7, I read that they marveled saying about Jesus, how has this man become learned, having never been educated? They marveled. 
And I was just speaking out of Acts 4 over in Africa, and uh, this reminded me immediately when I saw that in Jesus' life. They marveled at his words because he wasn't educated. And they, when they saw Peter and John, and they observed their boldness, their confidence, and realized they're not educated guys, they marveled. Acts 4.13, and realized that they had spent time with Jesus. May I just stop there and just say this? Our lives, lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, can produce the same marveling that Christ's life produced. Because it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now, I repeat it. When I read this, I marvel that Jesus marveled. I really do. It grabbed me. I marvel that he would marvel. Because, you know, it's only used twice of our Lord. Rightfully, we marvel at him two times. Right here, he marveled at this centurion's faith. And one other time, he marveled at their unbelief. Mark 6, verse 6. Isn't this just a carpenter? And they took offense at him. You see, Today, people either worship him or ultimately take offense at him. The word of the cross is either to you the power of God or it's foolishness and it's an offensive thing. And you may think you're taking middle ground, but that's not really the case. And there's twice that Jesus marveled at this guy's faith and at the rampant unbelief. Well, let's take a look at it <clears throat> because I want to learn everything I can about faith that would make Jesus marvel. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, if you disdain faith, if you fancy yourself a man of evidence, a woman who doesn't just believe anything, well, don't just believe anything. <laughs> but you can believe God and His Word. And without faith in God and His Word, it's impossible to please Him. We live by faith. We walk by faith. We grow by faith. Uh, I want to read this and learn everything I can about faith. When he'd completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And uh, that's his hometown after Nazareth completely was offended by him. It says he settled in Capernaum. And I know his home is in heaven. If ever a man modeled that, it's the man. He had nowhere to lay his head. But just the same, interestingly enough, this town on the Sea of Galilee is where he settled. Well, anyway, he, after he completed this discourse, he went to Capernaum, and a certain centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and was about to die. I mean, they brought hospice in. It was beyond hope. The, the thought here is that very sick, very sick, just about, and that's about to die. And when he heard about Jesus, this centurion sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave because he was highly regarded by him, notice, this slave. And when they'd come to Jesus, they earnestly entreated him, saying, He's worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. A certain centurion had a very sick slave, very sick, just about gone. And he said, come. But he didn't come to Jesus. He sent Jewish elders. He's a Gentile. And he sent the Jewish leaders. Now, he loved God. He loved God's people, Israel. And by the way, uh, it behooves those who love God to love God's people. You say, well, Israel's in unbelief. Yes, it is. The nation is in dire unbelief. Rod and Margie are laboring in one of the hardest fields around the world. 
and the laws and everything else are not hospitable <laughs> to the Lord. Uh, Israel was messed up and in unbelief in the first century, and it still is in the 21st century. But those who love him will love his people. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this man, notice, they said, he's worthy for you to grant this to him. He loves our nation. And it was he who built us our <clears throat> synagogue. Now, I don't think that he was a uh, you know, builder on the side. I think he used his money, his influence, to build a synagogue. And uh, so they just say, hey, you should do this, Lord. By the way, have you noticed? I'll just throw this out as a little sideline. Every centurion, maybe I should say almost every because I can't, but you, you look, and the centurions, these guys that had 100 men under them, we get the word century, you know, you think about it. These Roman centurion come off pretty well in the Scripture. I don't know what to say other than that it was a centurion who at the cross said, Matthew 27, truly, this was the Son of God. It was a centurion named Cornelius who was used to open the door to the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, Paul had that benevolent imprisonment where they wouldn't keep him from, from uh, his friends coming and ministering to him in Acts 24 under Felix, I think it was, but this centurion that watched over him. And on his trip in the boat, in the shipwreck, he was under the care of a centurion where he had the influence that he had and was able to have that almost hospitable time uh, where he was able to lead in the time of the shipwreck. Well, uh, it seems to me the Holy Spirit here underlines two characteristics of this centurion's faith, that Jesus marveled at and commended in such a strong way. First, it is a faith born of humility. Look at verse 6. I might just say, starting at verse 3, really, he didn't just go to Jesus. He took his place, and maybe that's troubled you in the, in the Gospels, that now and then Jesus would say, listen, I came for the house of Israel. And he said, Let, yeah, but even, even, the, even the dogs get the crumbs. And that gal willingly took her place as a Gentile dog, you might say. There's a humility in realizing that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And amazingly, he isn't parochial. He will spread his grace to all, but don't presume on it. And this centurion, he understood enough about God. He sent the Jewish elders. He said, please ask him. And when they got, you know, when Jesus started to come, he heard about it, and he sent, verse 6, Jesus started on his way with him, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself further. I am not fit for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I don't even consider myself worthy to come to you. Saving faith starts with brokenness, humility. Depart from me, Lord, Peter said in chapter 5. Why? Because I'm a sinful man. Have you come to that point? The faith Jesus commends is a faith born of humility. Later, he talks about the tax gatherer and the Pharisee. Remember in chapter 18? And the Pharisee came in and said, Boy, Lord, am I glad I'm not like the rest of these people. I'll tell you what. I come to you because, and he started listing how he could come to God. And the Bible says he was praying to himself. The tax gatherer said, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. I don't have any claim on you but sin. Real faith is a broken faith. And you know, as faith grows, it becomes more broken. I mean, read Job's life. And uh, the whole point of Job, it seems to me, is to get a, a proper appraisal of God and a proper, proper appraisal of 
self. And uh, this centurion said, I am not fit, verse 6, for you to come under my roof. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and undone, you know, Isaiah said. And Job, when he finally got the picture, he said, I repent and dust and ashes. I retract. I retract. It's a great day to come to the point where you quit thinking highly of yourself. God is opposed to the proud, gives grace to the humble. Hence, it isn't just a hobby horse when biblical preachers, when biblical teachers cringe when the gospel is made into some sort of self-image help thing. When Christian teaching is all about learning that you're a pretty neat person, it just kind of grates against what the Bible teaches. And it keeps people from really, in humility, finding that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. It can keep people from faith to be talking about what a great person you are or how you should have think more highly of yourself when the Bible says don't. And I know it's so swept through culture and Christ, and, or I should say culture and the church in such a way that a lot of, it sounds counter almost to say it. But it can keep you from Christ. Maybe it's kept you from Christ because you're trying to think of yourself as a pretty good person. No, you come as a broken one. And this centurion didn't say, hey, by the way, you should help me because I'm a, I'm a Gentile and I, 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 I'm quite high up in the Roman. I could be real of use to you, Lord, blah, blah, blah. No, he said, I'm not fit for you to come under my roof. I'm not worthy to come to you. I, I, I sent the, the Jewish, I sent my friends. Just say the word. Just say the word. By the way, I'll just suggest to you that Peter and Paul illustrate this principle that I'm after here in their lives. Peter at the beginning of faith, chapter 5, when Jesus said, why don't you put your net in over here? Lord, <laughs> I've been fishing all night. I kind of know what I'm doing, but at your word, I'll do it. And he saw what happened, and he went, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. When he started to realize who the Lord was, he repented. Paul illustrates how when faith grows, humility grows. As you mature, you don't start thinking more highly of yourself. You start thinking more lowly of yourself. And I'll give you three passages. You can just look them up on your own. 1 Corinthians 15, fairly early in his writing ministry. He'd been a Christian quite a while, but he said, I'm not fit to be called an apostle. I'm the what? Least of the apostles. But still, what did that make you? Well, that being the top 12, <laughs> right? I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not fit to be called an apostle. I blasphemed the church. It's humility. But the least of the apostles is one thing. Years later, when he's in jail writing to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 8, what does he call himself? The least of all the saints, chapter 3, verse 8. And finally, toward the end of his life, he doesn't say, I'm the least of the Christians, the godly ones, the righteous ones. He says, I was the worst of sinners. If Christ can save me, he can save anybody. And I... It's interesting to me to watch that progression. And I've observed it in men of God and women of God. As you grow closer to God, you don't have a higher opinion of yourself. Okay? This is faith born of humility. But secondly, and I'm going to leave it at just this, two points about this great faith. This faith, verse 7, was a faith in God's Word. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For indeed, I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. He understood who God is. He understood who Jesus is. 
And he said, you don't have to come to my house. You don't have to. I'm not fit for you to come under my roof. But I know if you'll just say the word, because I understand how authority works. And I've got somebody under me, and I just tell him what to do, and he does it. And I've observed who you are. And his faith was a simple trust in the word of the Lord. Just say the word. Just say the word. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Turn over to Hebrews 11. Turn over to Hebrews 11. Faith and the word are tied together everywhere you turn. Even at the beginning, Peter said what? Lord, I I really don't know about this putting the net on the other side of the boat, but at your word, I will do it. (laughs) And he learned something. Uh, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. That's the beginning point of faith. You take God at His word and you realize that God spoke. And it was done. Psalm 33. Let there be light. And there was light. Faith takes God at His word. Christian. You will never be disappointed taking Christ at His word. This centurion's faith, this great faith, this faith that Jesus marveled at, didn't demand proofs and signs and stuff. It just took him at His word and said, you can just say the word. I understand that. I understand your authority. And what was the result? Our text, verse 10. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. I really meant to point this out at the very beginning because um, this arrested my attention also. All the miracles of Jesus are made on purpose. I mean, he did these things for a reason, and they're to teach us. And uh, God didn't, his whole plan isn't to eradicate illness during this era, but his whole plan is to eradicate illness. There will be no illness in heaven, in the new heavens, in the new earth. There won't be arthritis. There won't be anything. He's going to wash away every tear. That's God's redemptive purpose. And salvation is this matter of being made whole, sound. And this particular word that he uses is the word, the slave was found whole, sound, in good health. It's weird that we get our word hygiene from. It's just what it ought to be. There's just a wholeness. And uh, it's used 12 times in the New Testament. Jesus used it back in chapter 5 when he said, you know, it's not those who are well who go to the doctor. And he used this term. If you're healthy, that's not when you're in the hospital or going to the clinic. Or whatever. It's when you've got problems. But those who are well, and Jesus used this term. Actually, in, in the prodigal, Luke 15, when the prodigal came back and his father received him safe and sound, that's this word. Do you ever think that way about your kids? I do, don't you? You pray. You love to hear they got there safe and sound or whatever. Or everybody's home and it feels good to just be safe and sound. That's the term that the Lord used when he told that story in Luke 15. And it's only used 12 times in the whole Bible in the New Testament. And eight of them, two-thirds of them, are in the pastoral epistles referring to sound words. Healthy teaching, sound doctrine. The exhortation overwhelmingly, really, in the New Testament 
when you come to this word, healthy and whole, what really life should be, it comes from sound teaching, sound words, sound doctrine. There'll come a time, Paul said in chapter 4 of Timothy, when they won't want to hear sound doctrine. But you give them sound doctrine anyway, Timothy and Titus. Those three epistles, Paul used this term a lot because, you see, when you and I feed on God's Word, we become whole and sound and healthy. And salvation isn't just merely rescue. God takes us from the wreckage of sin and makes us whole. And He does it by His Word. Feed on God's Word. Faith grows as you feed on God's Word. Take His promises to you in Christ as accomplished. We talk about preaching the gospel to ourselves, and it's a healthy thing. And when, one, uh, when we gather as elders, Steve boots us out of his house uh, at the end of our prayer time, he said, and sometimes he'll just say, I've got to preach the gospel to myself. And I know what he's saying. He gets his Bible out, and he doesn't want us hanging around anymore so he can listen to God. Feed on God's Word, and let the gospel be preached to myself. And that's what happens when you hear God's Word. Your faith grows, and you and I become more sound. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith honors God's Word. It honors His authority. I know how authority works, this guy said. I just say it, and he does it. Come, come, go, go. And we marvel at that. We like that in the military, don't we? We say, that's the way it ought to be. And the centurion said, that's the way it is with you, Lord. You have all authority in heaven and on earth. You can rebuke this, and my servant will be well. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve you to even come near me. <laughs> but he asked for and received. When you and I fail to take God at his word, we dishonor God, and we dishonor His authority. When Jesus heard this, He thamadzoed. <laughs> he marveled. He marveled at Him and turned and said to the multitude, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Jesus doesn't marvel at touchdowns or late-inning rallies or home runs or money or politicians or all the things that we might get pretty enthralled with. Jesus marveled when he found great faith, and he marveled at unbelief because ultimately this is the only logical thing. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not. Without faith, you can't please God. And faith honors God and pleases God. And it's the right and only thing. Oh, Christian, live by faith. And if you're here without Christ, put your faith in Him. He who believes in Him will not be disappointed. And you can take Him at His word. He really did rise from the dead. And it really should make us marvel. And He really is coming back. And we should reserve our marveling, really in the ultimate sense, for Him alone. And it's... I'll close with this. I, an occurrence I haven't given you yet. Don't marvel. Don't marvel that I said to you, you've got to be <laughs> born again. It's not enough to just say, I'm going to believe God for it. No, you believe God and He causes the new birth. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you've got to be born again. If you haven't been born again, talk to me. Talk to the one who brought you. We're, we're all people in this room. This church is made up of those who've been born again, those who've come to know Christ. From every kind of background, we've taken God at His word and we've found Him to be totally reliable. You can too. And I'll tell you what. One day we'll be in full health. We're getting there as our faith grows. He makes our homes healthier. He makes our lives healthier. And I'm not talking about physical health. We, we wear out and die just like everybody else. 
I'm talking about the wholeness of a life in right relationship with the Creator. 